another slow start, another goalless performance, and another road loss for Inter Miami. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio, your number one Inter Miami focused podcast, providing you all the latest news, updates, analysis, inside information, general punditry, and much, much more. Welcome back. My name is Franco Penizo. I'm one of your usual co hosts, and joining me, of course, is one other regular co host, and that is. Andrea Yanis, a.k.a. Ajisita. Andrea, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Franco. Glad to be back on the show. Um, glad to be here. And let's get into it because there's so much to talk about. Uh, you know, there's always news about this team. So let's do it. Yeah, well, there's some good news because Quarantan Coco Jean is now available for selection. He was formally introduced in a press conference on Thursday. We both expect him uh, to play on Saturday against FC Cincinnati, but there's also bad news to talk about because Inter Miami just suffered a 2-0 road defeat to reigning MLS Cup champions New York City FC at Yankee Stadium. So we will dive into those topics. We will also dive into Inter Miami's goalkeeper situation and whether it's time for Nick Marsman to get back into the starting lineup or not. Um, But before we do all that, It's been a rough few months um, for me and and for the family, but we lost a cousin last week in a a car accident, uh, Fernando Ezegaray, um, someone that I had grown very close to over the last year, year and a half. Um, Unfortunately, my cousin passed away, and it's another blow, and it's another difficult moment um, for us. So, you know, he was was a big, big, big fan of me covering Inter-Miami. Um, wasn't the biggest Inter Miami fan, but he loved that I covered the team, and he always told his friends about that. Um, friends always ended up asking me for tickets, even though I can't get tickets. But you know, a shout out to my cousin um, who unfortunately has passed. And uh, again, um, Fernando, uh, we love you, bro, Fernie. Uh, we will miss you dearly, brother. But you know, thank you for all the memories and and everything you have done. For me, since we were kids, to growing up playing soccer together, to um, you know being closer over the past year and a half, going out and and having a good time together with friends or family. Um, thank you, brother. Thank you. Um, you will be missed, and we love you. All right, guys. So, Inter Miami went on the road to the very narrow Yankee Stadium or the very narrow field at Yankee Stadium. And, well, as I mentioned before, they suffered a 2-0 loss to New York City FC. Goals from Maximiliano Morales and Eber on each side of halftime. Morales in the 12th minute, Eber in the 75th. This was Inter Miami's starting lineup. Reminder that both Damian Lowe and Bryce Duke were out due to yellow card accumulation, while Leonardo Campana did not travel due to the MCL injury that he is dealing with. So again, this is the this is the eleven. Drake Calendar in goal from right to left. You're back forward. Drake DeAndre Yedlin, Christopher McVeigh, Ryan Saylor, Kieran Gibbs. Your first line of the midfield were Gregory and Jean Mota. The second line of the midfield, Robert Taylor, Alejandro Pozuelo as the ten, and Indiana Vasilev up top, Gonzalo Iguain. So a four two three one on a very narrow field. Inter Miami had some chances in this game to potentially pull level. They did not finish once again. They gave up another early goal. They finished scoreless. Second half I didn't think was great. This marks the eighth time they've been shut out in the MLS regular season this year in 22 matches. Or excuse me, in 21 matches. And they've scored 22 goals in 21 games. So clearly, the attack continues to struggle. Uh, Andrea, what was your biggest takeaway, your biggest analysis point from this match? I have to come in hot, let me tell you. Okay, all right. The first thing I want to comment is that it's a disgrace. Listen to me, a disgrace that the champions of this league are playing in that field. It's a disgrace. That field is not regulation. That field is a disgrace. Horrible, horrible, horrible. They cannot even play <laughs> their international matches there because it's not it's not 
not on the minimum requirements for professional football. It's a shame that they are allowed to play in there. Although MLS and, and New York City FC claim that it's you know it, it meets the standard, it, the, it, the it minimum meets the standard, standard for for them because as you know they play the, the Champions League and Concacaf said no right, that stadium right. is a joke. You're not playing there. Look f for where to play. So I wanted to start with that because it's really a shame that the league is supposedly growing and you have the champions playing in a field like that. It, it, it was horrible. It's horrible. Oh, There's not more I can say. Yeah. And I was glad Flo. that you, you began saying that and I wanted to say it because it, it's horrible. It's it's really a, a shame that a team that is good, that, that is the champion, is playing in a field like that. Yeah, I man. don't care if it's Yankee Stadium. I understand it's Yankee Stadium, but it's a shame. It's a shame. That is not for, for football, for, for soccer, or whatever you want to call it. But that's my first thought. And the second thought is, like, Inter Miami are really unlucky. Um, let me tell you something. If if there is a big takeaway from this game is what we, we were talking a couple of weeks ago, how important Damian Lowe is for this team. Because you could tell. Um, that he was missing in 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 that uh, central defense in in the defense uh, it was it was very rough. Uh, New York City had the opportunity to win by a bigger margin, and well, we of course we have we are going to talk about uh, what Phil said in 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 the media availability this week about um, <laughs> about refereeing and all that, but you could have gotten even three zero if that uh, Tati Castellanos goal would have counted. We're going to discuss that later. You're going to tell me your opinion if you think it was a goal, if it was uh, uh, disallowed correctly, or if you thought it was a goal. And in the first goal that they had, the, the goal of Maximiliano Morales, um, well, in, I guess that is why Phil is talking, because um, that goal, we can talk about if it was offside or if there was um, a foul before on Pozuelo. We're going to talk about that. But my biggest takeaway is Inter Miami is so unlucky and they need to do better in attack. Um, they need to, to convert. They had a couple of opportunities. And my third point that I wanted to make on this podcast and I wanted to, to say it is that I should I think Sean Johnson could be a starting goalkeeper for the United States in the World Cup. I think he's a good goalkeeper and I think he could, could he could take the starting spot for the United States. No way he starts for the United States. No way, no way. But he's anyway, playing constantly. Matt Turner is oh, not going to play. Absolutely, absolutely. But Stephen it's, it's, is not going to play. It's between Matt Turner. It's between Matt Turner and, and Zach Steffen. Like I, I, that's, I mean, that's what I think because they're playing at a higher level and clearly they've been the they're ones. They're not that, playing. <laughs> well, they are competing or they practicing. Are they're practicing. They are yes, yeah, yeah, they're practicing yeah, at yeah, higher yeah. levels. Um, yeah. Zach, Zach Steffen did just secure a move, though, so he I do expect him to play yeah, this, this season. He but, will play more. But, yeah. but um, you know, even just looking at Greg Berhalter's choices with the U.S. men's national team, you know, the, those two have been the guys that have gotten the bulk of, of the starts, if not all of them. So, But anyway, that's not the goalkeeping uh, competition that we're here to talk about on this show. We will talk about Drake Callender and Nick Marsman a little later on, Andrea. Don't jump Don't jump the gun. Uh, but look, <laughs> I gave you three talking know, points, Franco, know, that I cover know. everything that we're going to talk about in this podcast today. <laughs> well, well the, the biggest, for me, the biggest takeaway and the biggest analysis point that I have, it's and it's just banging the drum over and over again, is that this team has a lot of issues and they keep reappearing as opposed to being addressed and corrected. And that's it. This team can't score goals. And as of late or over the course of a few weeks now, this team continues to start slow. And I think obviously when you can't score often that plays into your ability to start or your inability to have a better start because you struggle in that facet. So, you know, again, there was there was one play in the first half where Robert Taylor could have fed a low cross or a low ball to Alejandro Pozuelo. And Alejandro Pozuelo has an easier angle for the equalizer or for the would-be equalizer, if you assume he's going to put it in. But Robert Taylor takes a shot from the right, and it goes wide of the far post. And Pozuelo, you can see, is very uh, frustrated that he didn't get the pass. Obviously, Pozuelo's new. There's, they were still working on chemistry, but... I had I had said this when Pozuelo was signed or when he was introduced. He was going to help them, and they did have their moments, I think, in the first half. Second half, not so much, but in the first half, I think, Inter-Miami, 
you know, could have easily gotten an equalizer and maybe even deserved an equalizer. But he's only going to help so much because this team in general doesn't have very many goal scorers. It doesn't, it's not that lethal. It's not that dangerous from the run of play. So it's the same thing that's plagued into Miami this season for much of it, as well as going back to last year when they finished tied for, I believe, second fewest goals in all of Major League Soccer. I've, I've explained what I think goes into all of that. I think, I think there's obviously you know some responsibility on the players. I think there's responsibility on the coaching staff, the tactics. I've, we've talked about that. So, you know, Quarantan John, which we'll talk about later. Uh, Coco, we'll say Coco just to keep it uh, easier so we don't have to try to practice our poor French pronunciations. But Coco should help and should be another step forward for the attack. We will see how much help he actually is to the overall style of play. Andrea, you touched on the topic that Phil Neville touched on not only post game on Saturday but as well as on Thursday in his press conference previewing this weekend's game against FC Cincinnati and he talked about the referees and not you know Inter-Miami not getting the calls that they feel they should be getting and he you know today on Thursday he talked about how you know the overall general consensus consensus from coaches and, and just people in general is that calls balance themselves out over the course of a season and he feels that that is not the case right now that's how he feels that's why he said he feels that inter miami is getting hard done by they're getting more bad calls than good calls before we dive into phil neville's comments andrea you saw the play you've seen the replays first off did you think it was a foul on alejandro pozuelo on the build-up to New York City FC's opener and game winner, because he was on the ball. You know, I forget who was who was on top of him trying to get it from Rodriguez. him. Rodriguez. Uh, Rodriguez. Okay, so so there's a tug of the arm there, and then New York City FC wins the ball. They quickly attack because they won it in the defensive third or Inter Miami's defensive third. They quickly hit the pass to Morales. Morales scores from a tight angle. Was that a foul in your eyes, Andrea? I think, listen, I think it could have gone both both ways, but if you have a VAR and you're checking every goal like the league is doing, then I think it should have been called because it was a foul. And you supposedly watch every, every that since the play started, and that's where the play started. That's where New York City FC gets the ball. So if you have VAR and you check every goal to see every play and every goal, according to the rules, then you need to see that that was a foul. It was a clear foul for me. It was foul. Boy, then, hold on, hold on. You just said you could go either way, and now you're saying it's a clear foul. No, but I I understand it could go either way because I, they checked for an offside. They checked for right. an offside. Well, let's stick with the and foul it, first. Let's stick with the foul first before we get to the offside because the foul is what starts the sequence. The, the yeah. potential offside comes later. So let's stick I, with the foul first. Is so? I, do you think it, it's a foul? Yes, but I I am saying it could it, it could have gone go both ways because the referees interpreted that what they needed to check was the offside, not okay. the foul. Okay. So, I it, it's a mistake because the rules of VAR in this league say that you have to check when play starts and the play didn't start in the offside. It started with the foul, so it should have been counted in the goal. Should have not. Um, St- stood stand i don't know how to say it. Stood, so the goal, yeah yeah the goal shouldn't have uh shouldn't have counted so um if you go if you go strictly by the rules but but that is what i say it, it went either way because the reasoning is that they checked for an offside and there wasn't an offside okay i i agree with phil to a certain point that some calls that the referees uh have done are horrible the referees in this league i have said it a million times in the, this podcast you're probably bored of me calling out <laughs> the referees in this league and has, has pro are... has pro the referee organization have they called you yet because i expect them to have, uh, and to have given you Franco, a buzz. <laughs> oh my god and they are like listen to me i don't want to even start with that but if you saw us open cup games yesterday wow man they put it two pro referees 
to call those games. They were not even FIFA <laughs> referees. The, like the, the, off, the offside call that wasn't an offside call uh, in the in the Orlando City New York Red Bulls game. That one was. Just yeah. the conversation that they had to have on the sidelines was a bit yeah. like, wow, yeah. okay. But, um, well, those, and, and I understand, listen, I have said it like in the podcast, like, so many times also, I understand that Phil has to call it out because if, they're one of, if they were a winning team, you wouldn't be li- uh, listening, we wouldn't be listening to Phil right. calling out the, the, the referees right. as much as he has to do because his, team, his so, team doesn't win as much as he would like. So he needs to get the attention off of him to call out the referees oh, okay. in this in this moment i understand him because it was a mistake i so i disagree with you ways, but it was a mistake so of, of course i disagree with you because listen could it have been called a foul the, the, let's talk about the initial tug on on Pozuelo. could it have been called a foul yes it could have been called a foul is it absolutely criminal that it's not called a foul I don't think so. I don't know if you do, but I don't think it's absolutely criminal that there's no foul called. There's there's definitely contact there. It is a contact sport. Again, he could have gone either way. Okay, you don't get that call. You have to keep playing. I you think have to keep they should have called it because Pozuelo maybe didn't go after the ball because he felt it was a foul. Okay, but you, that, you can't not you can't just stop playing because you think it's a foul. You play to the whistle, and that's you know that's one criticism I had yeah, of, of the Red mistake, Bulls last but, night. And 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 you and you know I think also, also uh, the defense was was caught off guard because they thought it, they was, thought a it was a foul as well. That's yes, I, 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 I understand Taylor that. Late, I understand. I understand. Valentin tried to came, to come out, and he did good. But it it was a good goal. It was a good goal. Was it? Is it criminal in your eyes that they didn't call that a foul? Is it absolutely like you know? A, 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 yes, it's a foul, Franco. And if I, you have bad, I don't think so. I don't think the, so. The, the, the thing is, it's not like it's a say, hard slide tackle that they brought down. For I don't like and... that. Bad now goes to uh, to a central office in I don't know which city in the country, like they do in the NBA, instead of the the referee going and check it. So I don't know. I think it was a mistake, and of course it 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 did not help the team. It it. It did not help the team. It, it made them lose again very early in the game. That was in the 12th minute, if I remember correctly, yes, right? Yes, yes. 12 or 13 minutes. So I, so look, I don't it's think it's a mistake. foul. I don't think it's a foul, but I did think that on the replay, it looked like Morales was yeah, slightly offside. The goal, so I do think there was an offside there. Yeah, from what, from what no, we could see. From what we could see. Yeah, and then you have the, the, oh, the offside. But then again, if you look at Tati Castellanos' right, goal... Right, then on the second goal, I don't think there's an offside. Uh-huh, Excuse me, on, uh-huh. on the goal that was disallowed. Sorry, because I didn't mention that, that in the recap. That, so there is yeah. a goal that Tati Castellanos, the, the the striker that is departing to go play for Girona. This was his last game for New York City FC. He scores later on in the first half. And yeah, it goes to VAR, goal. and that one is called back for offside. Yes. I that was don't a little think, bit of compensation, I think. That one I don't <laughs> think was offside. Whereas the Morales goal, I don't think there's a foul in the buildup, but I do think Morales uh, or the pass in led to an offside that wasn't called. So That is I, why I agree with Phil of calling out the referees because see, no, you no, had so, the offside and you had the foul. The first goal should have been disallowed. Oh, okay, but then, by offside or by the foul. But then they so. get they get a call that goes their way from I mean at least from our seat, from our vantage point on the goal that gets that actually gets disallowed. So so Inter Miami would have been down. So Inter Miami would have would have ended up you know, I mean the game would have played out differently if there's no goal. So we can't yeah. I, I won't even go and say that. But Look, to me, this is a takeaway I had from this game. And this game, and even though Phil Neville was not as critical or nowhere near as... He wasn't foaming at the mouth like he was last year. It reminded me of the Portland Timbers loss during the 2021 season. When... One goal for Inter Miami, I believe, was disallowed. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember the incident. I think it might have been for a handball or or so, something along those lines. There was just a controversial call in that game, and Phil Neville afterwards tore the referees a new one, and he went at them and and you know he chopped the, he, he chopped got, the loss. and he yeah he got he ended up getting a he got a, a fine t- right yeah he got a talking to and and you know. It just reminded me of that moment because it's 
Can it have played a part in the defeat? Absolutely. Is that the only reason Inter Miami struggled in this one? Is that the only did they not have 78 other minutes to go look for a goal to tie the game up? Like to put it on that one play at the beginning of the game, especially when you got a call in your favor later on that could have gone either way for either team. I think it's we're we're seeing the same pattern that we saw last year of Phil Neville now looking and I don't know if it's if it's subconscious or not, but I just feel Neville looking for excuses as to why his team isn't performing because they still had the majority of the game to tie the, to tie it up. They still had it. yes, you don't want to be down one zero, especially not on a referee call. Although again, I don't think there was a foul. I do think that there was an offside, so it shouldn't have counted. Regardless, bad calls happen in sports. We were on this pod, Andrea, you and I talking a few weeks ago during after the Minnesota game where we both thought Inter-Miami got away with a a foul in the lead-up yeah. to the game-winning mm-hmm. goal for Indiana Vasilev. But that's not one. That's not going to be something that Phil Neville talks about in his press conference. I think, yeah, I think like we're at I the point where he's looking he for excuses. He talks about it because they lose. <laughs> right, I think, I think we're at the point now where he's starting to look for excuses because the team's just not performing. And when the team's not performing, I mean, is it easier to point your finger at the refs or easier to point your finger at yourself? I mean, it's easier yeah. probably to point the finger at the refs. Look, I'm not saying the referees are they covered themselves in glory, but it's refereeing, especially in MLS. Yes, we know it's poor. And guess what? It's poor for everybody. Do some teams get affected a little bit more than others? Yes, but that is not the reason Inter-Miami lost this game. Inter Miami lost this game because they cannot score. Because they don't have clear attacking ideas nor concepts when they have the ball other than get wide and whipping crosses to the middle. That is the only idea, the only football concept I see from Inter Miami and that I have seen from Inter Miami for much of this season. That's just my take. That's my opinion. It's my analysis. But and, that, and so I know, don't think I think it's I think it's not I think it's disingenuous or I think it's it's misguided maybe is a better word misguided to point the fingers at the referees because the that, proof when is in you the pudding. Lose, Franco, that is what you have to do. That is what you do when when you cannot. The problem with Inter Miami. You have to be autocritical, Andrea. You have yes. to have some self criticism, some self awareness, and be, say, look, Franco, this is where we are not team, doing good. When your team cannot cannot listen to me the first game that ever that inter miami came back that they did a remontada as we say in spanish a comeback was that minnesota game a comeback yeah a comeback thank you for that assist uh, <laughs> that first that was the first time inter miami you were an offside had, were you you were an offside on that one were you var 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 they need to bring uh, the English. <laughs> well, we, we'll just we'll just go to the bar. How about that? We just go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> to the bar, yes. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So that was the first time they do, they did it. They are they are a team that cannot do it in this precise moment. In this moment, they are not a team that can do it, and they are not a team that can do it against the champions, against a very good team, against a team that knows that know themselves very well like uh, New York City does. We saw it. Uh, the way that New York City uh, FC plays is very different uh, to the way that Inter Miami plays. And you can see it in the goals. You can see that Pozuelo, I told you, Pozuelo was caught off guard and he thought that it was a foul. He didn't follow the ball. But you you saw then how uh, Yedlin tried to cover for Sailor. Sailor was uh, out of place, couldn't get uh, to the... Um, to, to his mark, uh, to his position that he should have been. And New York City, uh, on the other side, don't make those mistakes. So Inter Miami, that is the only thing that they have. They have left because in this moment, they are not a winning team. In this moment, they are not a scoring team. So when they go back, it's an uphill battle already when you go back. But when you go back against the champions in their house, in their small field, and and all of that, it's gonna be hard for you to come back when when you have a team that does that doesn't score a lot of goals. Also, I want to mention that the opportunities that they had, well, I guess Johnson is is a good is a good goalkeeper, and you can say like 
they should be more killers, but well, you have wingers there that we know aren't that much of a scoring position all this season. Not Robert Taylor, not Vasilev. They have had goals, but they are right, not. They're not goal scorers. Goal scorers. They goals, goals aren't in their bag in an abundance, right? But like in, exactly. in Spanish, in Spanish, like, that's the thing. I, I wish there was a, a clearer way to say it, um, yeah. or a more defined way of saying it in English, so in, in English because in exactly. Spanish it's like "el tiene gol." That player has goals. Goal. In his bag, right? Like in his in his arsenal, in his in his game. Exactly. Uh, whereas in English, it's harder to define. I mean, I know in basketball, there's terms like you know he he's got a three or he can shoot a three. Like it's uh-huh. it's so I, I in soccer there, there, we have to I guess since it's still sports still developing, we have to find ways to better um or better have verbiage that defines these terms. But yes, there's not the wingers on this team don't have goals in them. In abundance, it's just not. But it was not part of who they to are. me to see Pozuelo get some plays with with Robert Taylor with Iwain. Iwain had an opportunity. Uh, when, that's why I say I say Johnson is a is a good goal, goalkeeper. But I don't know the team man is suffering. Uh, maybe with the addition, maybe as they go and 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 keep playing, they had bad luck with Campana's injury, with Ariel Lassiter's injury also. So it it was very hard. Listen, this game against New York City FC, it was very hard, and it could have gone even worse. If we're talking about the Tatis goal, who was uh, that they not count, they could have scored at least three more easily. Right. <laughs> they could have been losing by five zero this game at least. If 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 we're talking in reality, and that is why I told you in the beginning, my first point that they really miss Damian Lowe in in the central defense. Um, Damien Lowe is one of the most important players of the season for this team and you could see it this match you could see it in, in the second goal the ever goal uh, that, uh, DeAndre Yellen is out of position because he doesn't trust Sailor to, to cover his space because of the first goal I guess but he was out of position trying to cover Sailor's back and the, 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 well, the, the, the second goal Let's before we get to the second goal and I, I just want to quickly add this note because I just pulled up the article from last year that I wrote. So Phil Neville said Inter Miami was robbed after the controversial loss to the Portland Timbers. In that game, Inter Miami scored a late goal from Julian Carranza that would have been an equalizer, but it was immediately uh, waved off because of contact in the box between Carranza and Timber center back Dario Superich. So that in that instance, whether I agree or don't agree with the call, I can understand Phil Neville's point a little bit more because it's a decisive decision at the end of a game, right? Like if you score that goal, it's a tie. If you don't, well, then you and you lose. Then obviously it, it played a big role. This game, there was so much time left, and again, I, it could be a bad call. Whatever your wherever your vantage point is of it, wherever you sit on the, on this debate, it could have been a foul. It could not have been a foul. But Inter Miami had 78 more minutes to pull back to overcome a bad refereeing decision. And that they can't, well, then that speaks to the team. Again, eight now, shutouts. Franco eight Bush, shutouts. But they've been shut out eight times in 21 games, Andrea. They ha- it's not because Franco of the Bush, referees. The bench. It's, oh, no, who, sure. Who, the who bench. Correct. Ulloa, the bench in this game Emerson, was limited. The only attacking player. The bench in this game was very limited. I liked what I saw from Emerson Rodriguez off the bench once again. I thought he was one of the few bright spots. But. Again, the referees wow. are not why. Wow, is it snowing outside? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, hey, when he plays well, I'll tell you, hey, I thought he did well. When he does it, he does it. But hey, <laughs> what is it snowing outside? Uh, listen, the referees are not why Inter Miami have, have been held goalless, scoreless, have been shut out eight times in 21 MLS matches. And and that's, a, yeah, that's more I than agree. one third. That's more than one third, right? So it's it's not the I referee agree. every single time. You could yeah, maybe say that in this game or in that game – Fine, but it's not it's not the only reason. There are bigger reasons why your team is struggling to win games. And one of that is that you're struggling to score. And why are you struggling to score? Those are things that I think Phil Noble and his coaching staff need to look at. And those are things that they can control. That's the best way I can put it. Those are things that they can control. They can't control whether the referee makes a bad decision or not. And they can voice their displeasure and point the, point the fingers at the refs, but that isn't going to change anything by and large. We know MLS refereeing is, generally speaking, subpar. And that's going to take time and work and years for for refereeing, for officiating to get better. So, I think Inter-Miami, Phil Neville, I think they need to focus on what they can control. That is how they play. That is how they create chances. That is how they finish. 
Okay, let's. I can agree with you that that maybe they should have a little bit more. At least with when they come out to the media, I guess they really do when they talk in in the dressing room. But when when it comes to to the media, I I, I can understand your point that they need to be a little bit more more accepting of of their flaws. But I I don't think Phil likes to. Right, I know hundred percent. To, to do that, I don't I don't think, and this is just me, my opinion. I don't think Phil Neville is very good at ha- being autocritico, of having that self criticism and taking the. I don't think it's his like it's it's his first uh, or his default uh, option when things go wrong. I don't think it, he looks at himself and says, "Oh, it's it's me or something. I'm n- not doing right." Every once in a while, he he does you know point the finger at himself a, a bit and takes responsibility, but more often than not, during his tenure. It's been it's been the players. It's been coach. I mean, excuse me. It's been players. It's been refereeing decisions. It's been you know DPs not stepping up. It's 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 very rarely does he say you know I got this wrong or it hasn't been an abundance of him saying that. And obviously, Inter Miami hasn't done very well in his one season and change now almost two seasons. So you know, just look at where they've been in the standings. Look at their overall win loss and draw <clears throat> or win draw loss record. But anyway, let's go to the second goal because you brought it up. Heber ever finishes at the back post off a cross that comes in from Inter Miami's right flank. Now you touched on Yedlin. For me, if you go back and you know, I'm not saying you, Andrea, but just the listeners, if you go back and watch the goal, the spaces between the midfield line and the back line are completely out of sync. They are too far apart, and that allows for the entry pass to come in in between those lines. And that's and the entry pass comes from the from New York City FC's right flank, so Inter Miami's left it goes towards the middle. Then it's opened out to Inter Miami's right flank. So the ball essentially moves from, if you're watching it on TV, from right to left. Or if you're from looking at it from an Inter Miami standpoint, and I might have just confused the listeners, but if you're looking at it from Inter Miami posture, it came from Inter Miami's left flank all the way to their right flank. The cross comes then. Back to the left, and Eber finishes at the back post. There are individual marking breakdowns along the way. A bit of bad luck because the cross, I believe, there's a deflection there, and it just happens to fall um, closer to Eber than to Kieran Gibbs. But that the lines are too far apart, and I, you know, I would implore you guys to watch it again if you have not, you know, if you have not gotten a good look at it, go back and watch it. The lines are too far I, apart, and that's what—that's the initial breakdown that allows for the rest of the dominoes to fall. And that, again, but that unfortunately, sense, that's that's on coaching. But that's for, on coaching. That's on no, coaching. No, Franco, that's not on coach. I, well, maybe the instruction was go and look for for. A then time. the whole team has to go for. So you don't. Like, you, exactly that's, that's what I'm saying. That's why two coach. different. When you see a defensive line that's playing further back. That shows me a team that's looking to to protect its goal and hit on the counter. When I see a midfield line that's pushed further forward, then, like you just said, it looks like they're looking for the tying goal. And if they're not yeah. on the same page, if those movements are not synchronized... That, no, I don't think it's on coaching. I, I think it's the team where we're... we're... <laughs> Volcados, o sea, they were trying to attack, they were trying to to get it, and that the problem is that when you have a hole, you are trying to get a tie, and you have a hole in the midfield that is going to happen. The problem is when you have um, maybe uh, an inexperienced player like Sailor in your central defense with another that has been playing on their <laughs> on on the left side as McVeigh has been then you have you you cannot move forward your 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 defensive line that is the truth with inter miami you cannot so what happens is that yellin has to run and has to run to look for an attack but has to run then he does it well he has been doing it well but he has to run back and when he ran back in this goal he tried to cover sailors says back and that is why the I you're talking about, you, I know, I'm, sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna just uh interrupt you there because the center back that Yedlin was playing next to was Christopher McVeigh. Ryan Saylor was playing the left center back position and he was the one that tried to cut off the play on the first goal. But on yeah. the second goal, it's Christopher McVeigh that's closer to DeAndre Yedlin, not not Ryan Saylor. Oh, well, either 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 or, but Yedlin tries to cover that, that back and that is why he is late 
to to be I'm looking at it right now. Player. I'm looking at it right the now. The player. Yeah, look I'm at looking, it. He I'm tries going to up. run, and he goes, instead of going to the side, he goes to the middle. He goes towards the middle, right. But listen, yeah. so, but the, okay, so New York City FC starts with the ball in the midfield. They play it out wide to their right flank. And Emerson Rodriguez is there. I think he does a decent job of marking. I don't think there's there's much you can nitpick there. You know, he he, he gets over. Yeah. He blocks. He tries to block the pass. Maybe he could have done a little bit better. But the pass is an easy pass because Gregory and Jean Mota, who should be filling that space, are pushed further up the field. Why are they exactly. pushed? Why are they pushed further up the field? When because inter, they are when inter, looking for a tie. But Inter Miami is starting replegando. At least the back line is retreating. So when you retreat, you have to retreat as a team, not as not as just you know two separate entities. Backline retreats, midfield stays up there because that's where the initial breakdown comes from. Then the ball's played to to the other flank, and another low pass. Then you're right, DeAndre Yedlin does occupy a more central space as opposed to to, to trying to cut off the cross from the from the from the wide area. Um, he eventually does try to get over there, but it's you know he, it's too late. And then, you know, obviously the cross comes in and there's a goal forever. So And when the cross comes in, the problem is that the, the problem is the problem that this defense is having. And we had this conversation when the own goal happened against Orlando because they all tried to go. Because Yellin, because it's McVeigh or whoever plays, whoever the the left or right backs are and the other central defender are trying to cover the like how do you say uh, your the the shortcomings of their teammates so they all try to go to the same place so when you get there's only one player on heaver and that's gibbs that you have you have to have if the other central defender was going to the other side the other one should be on the striker not the left back so the inter miami doesn't defend well it, it, not not that it doesn't defend well it's not organized enough they make too many mistakes because they try they try to cover so, their so back so sailor sailor's following i think talis magno on the play i'm looking at it again right now he follows talis magno who makes a, a run into a central channel and, and so t- t- uh, excuse me sailor does his job and it just happens to be that Eber makes a run to the back post. He's actually outside of Kieran Gibbs when, when even before the cross comes in. So it is Kieran Gibbs' guy just based off of the play and how it unfolds. Uh, and again, a bit of uh, misfortune there because there is a deflection that, that kind of directs the ball closer to Eber than Kieran Gibbs. But, you know, again, for me, the breakdown comes in, in between the lines. Too easy. Gregory, who's the pit bull terrier, should have been there. Why isn't he there? I don't put it only on him because him and Jean Mota and and uh, and I think it's Robert Taylor who's playing right midfield at the time. I'd have to go back here and look, but, they're, but those those know, three are not Mota on the same page. They're there. not on the. They try, Mota but they're but they're too. Get... But this game, this, this football is about uh, you know inches and 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 feet or yards or how meters, however you want to judge. It's about the spaces, and they gave up too much space on that sequence. And and again. One part of Inter yeah. Miami is defending. The other part of Inter Miami is looking to. They gave to... up too much space, also in defense, because Yellin should have gone to what corresponds to him, not what corresponded to McVeigh or Sailor, whoever it was. Absol- Again, there's absolutely he individual have gone breakdowns to his place. There's absolutely not... individual breakdowns there, but I think yeah. collectively so, is the first. Is where I the know first that Yellin falls. obviously does it because he doesn't want to get a score. Uh, uh, he doesn't want to lose by more goals, obviously. But there is th- that is why I asked... You're saying he misread Gallagher. the play. You say, you're saying Yedlin no, misread not, the play. Not that he misread the play, that he tried to cover his teammates back. But I wouldn't say that... See, look, so I'm looking at the play again and again and again and again, and I wouldn't put that on Yedlin, nor would I put that on McVeigh. I put that on Robert Taylor. Because Robert Ta- that is Robert Ta- based on the play I'm seeing and how it's unfolding, that should be Robert Taylor's man to mark because he comes from a deeper area in the field. He makes a, a trailing run that, that the ball and the ball finds him. Robert Taylor should have been backtracking, should have been running with him to cover that and not allow that easy pass to the wide open man that whips in the cross. That's Robert Taylor's guy. Yedlin, I don't think, is wrong in, in taking up a more central channel. But again, it's you know you could say it's poor recognition from Yedlin um, and not seeing that that his teammate didn't track back. You could put on Robert Taylor for not tracking back. Again, there's there's definitely a hundred percent individual breakdowns in this sequence. For me, collectively, 
I think there's more there's more it's more on the collective than it is on any one individual but anyway I could accept I could accept that and and that is why I'm telling you I don't think that they have chemistry enough chemistry well enough this was a new backline right enough, this was a new enough backline tra enough trust enough chemistry whatever you want to call it I don't think that they have it that much because it has been changing a lot like it happens in the attack you change you bring Emerson you bring Ariel you bring Campana the team Changes too much. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with that. But like again, so if, I, if Robert Taylor's problem, not tracking back, I don't think that has to do with the changing parts in the back line. I agree with you in general. The Inter Miami underfill level, they change the formation a lot. They change personnel a lot. There's not there's not a whole lot of consistency now. Sometimes that's just due to injuries and suspensions. But other times, I do think that you know film level might tinker a little bit too much, which doesn't give you that consistency, that continuity, that that familiarity that you want as a cohesive yeah, team. I agree with that. That's what I was I trying to say. Yes, you said it best. I, I agree with that. Sometimes I cannot explain it in English, but don't worry. The Spanish show is coming, Andrea. The Spanish they version don't, is coming. They don't. They don't have in. They don't know each other that much. Chemist. That is why I use chemistry because they don't know what each other. If like Damian Lowe and McVeigh could play better because they are the best central defenders that the team have. So they they have more chemistry they got, have more knowledge maybe they can know where which way the other one is going to go but when you bring Mavica when you bring Sater when you bring McVeigh back into central defense when he has been playing to uh, to through the um, through the side it's difficult so I, that is why I understand Inter Miami not getting the results as often as we would like because they they change they change and they change a lot they change the responsibilities each player has uh, have sorry they change they change they 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 are changing even with Gregory and Mota that have played the 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 most minutes in this team one day they have certain responsibility. I think the other McVay day they and have... Yedlin have the most minutes, but I'm just yeah. nitpicking. I think McVeigh and Yedlin have it though. But I, I get your point. But look, look, Andrea, let's move forward so that we can preview this next game because it's Inter Miami's chance to right the wrongs and correct itself and get back on track. They play FC Cincinnati at home on Saturday night at Drive Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Fingers crossed for no more weather delays, or at least not in this one. It's an important game because in MLS, as it's called uh, informally, this is a six-pointer. It's a direct competitor for a playoff spot. FC Cincinnati, which has enjoyed a modicum of success this year. There are seven wins, seven draws, and eight losses, which isn't great. It's practically 500. But they, you know, this is the best that they've done, and I think, in their existence. So right now they hold the seventh place the Existence last place in playoff, mls in mls yes correct correct thank you for correcting me now they hold the seventh place spot in the eastern conference standings they have 28 points from 22 games that is just only three more than inter miami which has 25 from 21 25 points 21 games so if inter miami wins they're tied with Cincinnati. That does not mean that they'll take second place because New England, Chicago, Charlotte are all ahead of Inter Miami and you have to see what their results are. But it keeps them in the overall picture a little bit tighter. If Inter Miami draws or loses, and again, it depends on the results in other games, but if you draw and if you lose, if you lose, that could be very, very damaging to your playoff chances because now you fall further away from at and you least the seventh place game. team, right? And there's and there's more away games to come, but we, we'll dive into that in a second. So Saturday is a very big game for Inter Miami. It should mark. We are expecting the debut of Coco, aka Quarantin Jean, uh, who spoke to us today. He was formally presented in a press conference on Thursday. He posed for a picture with Phil Neville. He spoke to us in French. There was a translator that that tra- uh, that translated. Sorry for the redundancy there, but. There was a translator that let us know what, what Coco was saying in, in in English. So, Andrea, let's start with Coco. Based on what we've heard today, and you can dive into it to give the listeners more information, do you think he starts or do you think he comes off the bench? I think he will start. Wow. Yeah, okay. Phil said that he has not played since May, that he had been in a hotel for two weeks in Paris, and that he came and had only 
trained for a week with the team. So I guess he had been training since we only see 15 minutes. We, we couldn't tell if he was there or not when he came. And they normally train he, on the far field, normally. Yeah. Right? And so like, unless you have when, binoculars, it's we hard, don't it's We don't see. know. Let's tell our listeners we don't know. When 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 was his first training? They just said a week ago he was uh, he began training with the team. So um, seeing the necessity and the importance. My sources uh, are that, on it. That, My sources are on that, it. Yeah. Well, Franco, you need to trust <laughs> Franco sources. They are the best in the business here in South Florida. Um, I think yeah, seeing the necessity and the importance of that Inter Miami have and the importance of this game because of the points and of uh, the playoff battle that you're having with all of these teams, Toronto, Atlanta, New England, Chicago, Charlotte, Cincinnati, Columbus, <laughs> Orlando even, only Montreal is a little bit higher. But uh, seeing that battle, this is an important game. This right. is a very important game. I think Phil will, will he knows of the quality. He knows that, well, he had been on vacation, but he had been playing in, in, in the French first division. So he has, Rhythm, he's he's um, a player that has been playing in, at, at the first level. Pozuelo was the same. They were saying, oh, he needs to get used to the heat. He, and he started his first game. So I think Inter Miami needs something new. And I think he's going to start because of that, because he needs something new. And he's going to come off like in the 60th minute, 50th minute, whatever, or after the first half, depending on the result. But I think I think we'll, we will see him because Inter Miami and Phil Neville have the necessity and have the obligation of, of winning this, this game. I like it because, you know, press conferences, you know, it's not always direct things. And it's not always about what's directly said. It's, all, it's about sometimes reading between the lines as journalists. And, and, you know, I thought Phil Neville in Thursday's press conference, I thought he was pretty good at not tipping his hand one way or the other. Where you could read into it either way because... I don't think he starts. I could see that in him starting. Very Steve Brenner of me being on the fence there. Because, you know, it could be Phil <laughs> Neville. It could be Phil Neville. Shout out to Primo, who is away right now. Um, dealing with some other work, but he'll be back soon. But, you know, I, I could see it as, as Phil Neville trying to fib as to not tip his hand that, that Coco will start. Based on, you know, on the way he said things. But... My interpretation, and just putting, you know, this is not inside information. My sources have not told me this. I don't think he starts. I don't think he starts. I think based on the fact that they did talk about, and again, maybe Phil Neville is bluffing. Maybe he's trying to, to keep his cards close to the vest. But based on what he said, and based on taking into everything into account, Corentin John has not played in a couple of months. He has trained with the team for one week. One week, so... From a fitness standpoint, he can't be anywhere close to 100%. Sharpness standpoint, he can't be anywhere close to 100%. And tactically and learning the teammates and their movements, I just don't think he will start because of all those reasons. Then you have to also don't forget to take into account, it's no minor thing, that there is heat and humidity here in South Florida. And that does take getting used to. Emerson Rodriguez recently said it. I think he said it actually earlier this week that he's still been adapting to that. And Coco, in Thursday's press conference, said it's something he's going to have to get used to as well. So, based on all those factors, as badly and as desperately as Inter Miami needs some more attacking punch, I don't think he starts this one. Could he? And could he? he? He absolutely could. And maybe, you know, next week I'll be like, Andrea, your read was, was better than mine. I, again, I could see it happening, but I would say based on all those factors, I don't think so. Because it, it requires you to make an immediate substitution either at the 45th minute or at the 60th minute you're now forced to make a substitution because he's not going to be able to give you 90 minutes i just you know yeah. physically he's not yeah. going to be able to give you that after after an extended break you, you could see that but you can also you, I, I take into account what phil said today and uh, also the games that they have they have three games in a week so uh i think the easiest game for Corentin jean to play I think it's easier for him to to get his first experience with the team at home that Inter Miami do so much better than what they do um, on the road. And you need to um, assess also that Leonardo Campana and Ariel Lassiter are still not ready. You don't know if you're going to have them ready to travel 
to to California and then to Ghana. Uh, so this is the moment to do it. You need him to get into the rhythm now. You cannot wait. In this the moment that Inter Miami is leaving, you cannot wait. So uh, that is why I think he he will start and 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 then. I also asked Phil about Emerson, and he said basically that he was coming in, so maybe Emerson can come in for for Coco. So let's see. It's gonna be interesting. Maybe I think Phil needs realizes that he needs to get everything that he has, especially for this game that is the most winnable game in this. In this in these three games that they have in a week, maybe we can see Corinton John. He said that he preferred to play as a second striker. Wait, wait, wait. So before we get maybe. there, before we get there, before we get there, Andrea, because to your point, this is a very important game, Andrea, because it is again a, a direct competitor for a playoff spot. Montreal is also competing for a playoff spot, but they're much higher up the table, and you know they have further distance or more separation from Inter Miami in the standings. This is also a home game for Inter Miami, where they've been pretty strong this season. So I, I agree that this is the most important of the three because of who they're facing and where they're facing them. So I think, I think again, if if Coco had been playing like Pozuelo, because you, you compared him to Pozuelo, Pozuelo had been playing for Toronto FC. He came in with you know some level of fitness. I don't think Quarantan John is coming from a level of fitness or a base level of fitness that will allow him to start in the humidity in South Florida because, again, that will require Phil Neville to make a substitution early on. I think he comes off the bench, but we'll see. We'll see what happens on Saturday. Now, you just started touching on something, and we have a couple more topics to talk about before we close out the segment. You touched on something that I think is interesting. Today, during the press conference, Jose asked him where he likes to play. He asked Coco what position he likes to play. And Coco said he prefers to start up top, but that he's also comfortable playing on the wing and that that's where he's been used in these training sessions under Phil Neville and Inter Miami. Now, he could be bluffing. We don't know. But let's go with the assumption. Let's just go with his words at face value here. What did you what do you take away from that? What 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 does that say to you that he's playing on the wing but he's not playing in his preferred spot? It doesn't surprise me because that is what Phil likes. That is who Phil is as a coach. He likes to play through the sides, through his wingers, through his left back and right back. So it doesn't surprise me that Phil would prefer him playing there as he does with all the players that have come here. We can talk about Robbie Robinson, Pizarro, Luis Morgan, all the players that he has had all these two years almost that he's been with the team. So it doesn't surprise me, but um, it does surprise me that he said that he preferred to play as a striker because maybe it's a little bit of a message for him, a little bit of the option that he has, a little bit of putting that in people's mind seeing as what he said he analyzed and he saw Inter-Miami Inter -Miami games and what they were missing and all of that. So it was very interesting to me to see that to, that he, um, he, he expressed that and he put it himself in a position and let people know that he can also help the team to score goals. Well, I'm, I'm glad he was honest. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking yeah. it at face value. I'm glad he was honest about what he prefers yeah. to play. He, he wasn't like, you know, he didn't give some stock answer like, oh, you know, I, I'll play anywhere the coach tells me to, even if that's uh -huh. a goal. You know, exactly. I like that he said, this is, this is where I prefer to play, but I'm also comfortable yeah. in the wing and I will play there. Or I've been playing there. No, I have no problem with that. And, and you know, going longer term, longer picture, Maybe this year, because of the lack of production from the wingers, maybe this year Inter Miami looks at him as a winger. But maybe next year, when we assume Gonzalo Higuain will not be on the roster, and when Leonardo Campana may or may not be around, maybe Coco is the backup striker option next year. Maybe that's what they're thinking longer term. But again, that's just you know just supposition. On my part, what I would say about that comment, or you know, that that declaration, that remark from Coco in his pre in his press conference today, it's another sign of Phil Neville fitting players into his system as opposed to fitting the system around his players. Now, if yes. you understand what I mean, then yes. that's easy enough. But if you don't, 
look, there are two philosophies that coaches can have. Coaches can either, you know, they can have a certain set system in their minds and they can try to use the pieces at their disposal on the roster to fit that system as best as possible or you can have the players on the roster at hand and then mold the system to what they offer you. Two different philosophies. There's no right or wrong. There's no, you know, it's just a matter of opinion, a philosophy of idea. But I think this is another example of saying or showing that it's a, you know, Phil Neville prefers that players fit his system as opposed to molding his system around the players. So I think that that is telling because if he prefers to play striker, but they're using him on the wing, albeit he has experience there, then clearly it's not where he's most comfortable. He might be comfortable there, but it's not where he's most comfortable. It's not where he prefers to be. So, And you know, we asked Emerson about this on on Monday, Tuesday. I don't Tuesday, remember Tuesday. when. The, and, and we asked him he was comfortable playing as a nine, and he also was very honest, and he said no. He said he had never played there before. <laughs> yes, and that he's not comfortable with that. So you see, sometimes player have, players have to adapt to what the coach wants, We've seen this with Inter Miami. That is why I mentioned Lewis Morgan. That is why he left, because he played out of position. That is why Pizarro was unhappy. He played out of position and had another problem. That is why Robert Taylor uh, also has been playing out of position. So, you know, it, it's... Hold on, but it's hold on, Andrea. Hold on. And I also understand Phil... Andrea, trying... hold on, hold on. Uh-huh. Lewis Morgan left because they traded him away. Now, now. Franco, he was wasn't he? happy. After okay, having yes, yes, being the yes. Goal okay. With Diego Alonso and being the best player, he hold was on, relegated hold to on, play. Hold on, hold on. I'm like, giving you, I'm giving situation. you the benefit of the doubt. I'm, I mean, I'm giving you the razón. I, I had spoken to people close to Lewis Morgan, and they said he was not the most happy playing as a wing back last year. That that yeah. was not. Some, you know, he would do it, and publicly he would put on, you know, be professional and put on and say the right things and put on a good face. But he was not yeah. the most happy doing that. And clearly, if you're a winger and your game is, is attacking-minded and you're asked to defend a lot more now, then you've, clearly you're not going to be happy. And look at his numbers this year with the Red Bulls. Man, he is lighting it up. He is having a great he season is, yeah. with the New York he Red Bulls. He scored yesterday. Yeah, they he, lost, scored, he scored in the Open scored. Cup. It was his third yeah. goal in op- Open Cup play. I think he has 10 in MLS play. So he has more than Leonardo Campana. He has more than anyone on Inter-Miami. Yeah, So yeah. listen uh, to me. I have said this a thousand times. And this is something that Phil feels, feels does. Because he likes, the, like you said, he likes the player to fit his get system. into his system. Right. Not, uh, not create a system for the player to right. fit but in. But that, that comes and down we, to philosophy. But that, that comes down to I philosophy. Talk, that is what I talk about. Luis Morgan, Pizarro, uh, you have Julian Carranza also, they, because he used to play as a winger. Then you have Robert Taylor, who plays in the middle, Vasilev, right, who right. plays I in the middle. I agree with you. I agree with you. But it, that, that comes down to philosophy. There's no, there's no right or wrong there. There's no right or wrong yeah. there. It's just a philosophy. Yeah, that is personal for, for every coach. So when the season ends, we will see if right. he was right or he was wrong. Right, right. But the results will tell us. The results yeah, will exactly. tell us. And he has said it. On, he said it today. He likes players to come and work and follow instructions. That is what he has said. So that is what he likes. Well, I mean, I'm sure Maybe every, every coach likes a player to we, come in and follow instructions. We, we think... No, because sometimes play, coach. I want are, players to come in that don't listen to what I say and do whatever the hell. No, they when you have a when you have a superstar, you're you're not gonna tell me. You're gonna tell Bale, no, go and play as a left back. Oh, I mean no. that's that's different. That's, okay. that's <laughs> but different. Inter Miami but, has been has had even Gonzalo Iwain playing as a ten, so <laughs> things don't count in Inter Miami. That is why I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to one more talking point. Drake Callender or Nick Marsman in goal? Who do you think starts? He, you know, Phil Neville was asked about that in the press conference today. I wrote an article Wednesday about saying, is it time for Nick Marsman to start? Or is he poised to start over Drake Callender? And again, this is not inside information. This is just my supposition from the outside. And I'm not uh, vouching or I'm not saying Nick Marsman should start. I'm saying, is Phil Neville thinking about starting him? Because Drake Callender has been, overall, in my opinion, good during his starts. 
But his form now, from where it was at the beginning of his stretch of appearances as Inter Miami's number one, I think the level is lower now. I think it's dropped. And I think the first goal, something we didn't touch on in the game against New York City FC, he could have done better there. Yes, you could talk about the foul, you could talk about the offside, but, you know, Maximiliano Morales practically had no angle, and Drake Hallander does do a good job of, of shuffling over, but he leaves his legs yeah. wide open, and then the ball but goes in between them. He did the correct thing. He tried to cover. Oh, absolutely. Come out but, and cover. And, and, but you, and can't leave your, it, you can't leave your legs that wide open it, it when, was, when it's a it tight was angle. Unlucky. It was unlucky that he went through the Cocinita style. But I think he he, uh, he I said it before he did a good job in trying to 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 come out. That is what a goalkeeper should do. Absolutely, but then you can't leave your legs that wide open because if he has no angle, then you just got to keep your feet firm on the yeah. ground and and it's an easier save for you. Instead, you you give him a hole to put the ball through, and that's exactly unfortunately for Inter Miami, unfortunately for Drake Keller, it's exactly where Maximiliano Morales puts it. And on top of that, uh, you know Drake Calendar did recognize this week. He was autocritico. He was. He did have some self criticism, and he did say, "I wish I could have had some of those goals that I've given up in recent games back." Uh, and, yeah. and that he felt he could have done more for the team or shown up more for the team in recent matches. So, as Listen, for as um, for what Phil Neville said, Phil Neville today said Nick Marsman made a real a real push this week, and obviously, uh, you know, Drake Calendar. Is done well. He didn't really say one way or the other, but he did go at length to defend Calendar in terms of the I think numbers. Calendar will start against Cincinnati. I agree. We have said with Jose, both of us, that uh, Marshman should start instead of Calendar. But in this moment, if you sit Calendar right now, you can um, uh, you have to find a way to sit him, not to destroy his confidence, because since that that own goal from Orlando, we have seen that his confidence is not the best. We have seen it with all the goals he could have done. He has ha, ha, has had saves, but not as much as he did earlier in the season. So I think Phil needs to be intelligent in this moment and maybe uh, start him on, on Saturday and then give the opportunity to Nick using that you have to travel, you have three games in a week. So we're going to rotate the team. We're ro- going to rotate the goalkeeper and then see how Nick does and uh, how Nick uh, gets that responsibility back to see uh, who who will stay being the, the number one goalkeeper. But if you stay him right now, like in the position that he is, you could do a lot, a lot of, 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 uh, what's the word? You could do a lot of harm to his career and to his development uh, as a goalkeeper if you see him. Well, I think uh, listen. Or, I think I think they have. Or, I think Phil Noble needs if to. If you just see do... him in, in in and if you say like, no, you've been doing poorly, you're gonna. Well, listen. It's, it's professional it. sports. It's professional sports. I think Phil Noble needs to do what's best in Inter Miami's interest, not necessarily what's in Drake Calendar's interest, because the team needs to win. And if he thinks Nick Marsman is better, gives the team a better chance to start now and give uh, and to give them that chance to win, then. You make that call, and if you know you you have to work on Drake Calendar in terms of his confidence and all that later on. But I do think, just to to answer the question, I do think Drake Calendar starts based on how I don't want to say defensive, but on, on how much of an argument Phil Neville made towards how well Drake Calendar has been playing. I think that was a little bit of a sign that even though Nick Marsman's chomping at the bit and he's right there behind clipping at the heels of, of Drake Callender, I think Drake Callender still gets the start. The only reason I even, you know, thought about the article and I wrote the article was because Inter Miami's attack is struggling and they need all the help they can get. Nick Marsman, obviously, clearly, if you've watched both goalkeepers, is much better, much more skillful with the ball at his feet than Drake Callender. Maybe not as good of a shot stopper. I don't think he's as good of a shot stopper, although you and Jose have... We've- have, yes, have we, argued that with Marshman me very strongly. Is a more complete, a more complete, and listen, Marshman will also help uh, to for the defenders. Whoever plays that defending that defense, uh, the back line that is a revolving door, uh, it will be better f- having a leader like Marshman because he is a veteran player. So he, they trust him more than what they trust Drake. I Cameron. mean, that, that, that absolutely is something you can take into the equation. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, I don't disagree with that. I still just think Drake calendar right now, from what I've seen, although I again, admit that his form has dropped off a bit. I think he still is a better shot stopper than Nick Marsman. That said, he had good saves against New York city. 
and that, but that said, the reason why I even wrote the article and I framed the question is because given that Inter Miami needs more help in the attack and that Nick Marsman is able to pick out a pass much better and he can he helps in the build out a lot more and that he played against Barcelona, I think Nick Marsman is closer to he's going being to the play number against one. San Jose. I think I think yeah, I think he could play against San Jose because that's a Western yeah. Conference game. It's not a direct opponent. It's it's a, it's a short turnaround with lengthy travel. I think that could be a game where they, yeah. they take a look at him to see where he's at in a game situation. Yeah. Now, and it'll be good also for the competition um, uh, to give him that opportunity, but knowing how to give it to him. Because if not, then you will have an, un- an unhappy Drake calendar and you don't know how Nick Marshman is physically if he can withstand receiving a, 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 a blow or something like that. You don't know how his back is. So you need to you need to keep your second goalkeeper happy, okay. whoever it is. Well, last question, very quickly. Just one a number, Andrea. That's it, just a number. Give me a number. How many points does Inter-Miami get from the next three games? It's a busy, busy week. They play three times, like you said, in a span of eight days. So how many points do they get? Inter-Miami at home versus FC Cincinnati, Inter-Miami on the road against the San Jose Earthquakes, and then Inter-Miami on the road next weekend against CF Montreal. So, how many points does Inter Miami collect on this important three-game swing? Four points. Four. Do they win this weekend? Yeah, they win against Cincinnati, they tie against San Jose, and they lose against Montreal. I say they draw this weekend against Cincinnati, and they beat San Jose. I agree that they lose to Montreal, so based on where we're at today. So I say I cannot, four I points I cannot as let well. you go. Yeah, four points. I cannot let you go without giving a shout out to my boy Romel Kyoto, who is one of the best strikers in the league. Nine goals. <laughs> um, I'm not going to give Romel Kyoto a shout out because um, I'm not Honduran and there's no need for me to give him <laughs> a shout out. But you, you just did. So there you go. There's your Honduran uh, your shout out for the day or for the week. There's okay. always one. <laughs> there's always one. With exactly. Me. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. There is always one with Andrea. Okay. Well, let's leave it there. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll do a very short Q&A session. We'll give our final thoughts and we'll get to all that after this. Okay, guys, Q&A, we'll do a couple of questions. I will start with someone that I actually thought of recently because I had not seen him submit a question. It's someone I have met in person, and that is Lucho Lalo, 1896, of Vice City. And he says, Franco and gang, long time no ask a question. In light of Orlando in the final of the U.S. Open Cup, are Inter-Miami fans rooting for Sacramento Republic? I know I am. Orlando City winning something I feel sets us back. Hope they lose the final. They lost the MLS's back tourney final in 2020. And yes, they did, Lucho Lalo. They lost to the Portland Timbers in that competition that was held in Central Florida. By the way, thanks for submitting a question. I literally, I swear, I kid you not, no fingers crossed, no toes crossed. I literally thought about you like a few days ago and I was like, man, I haven't heard from Lucho Lalo in a Q&A session in a long time. I was like, I wonder if he's still listening. I don't know what happened, but I'm glad to hear that you are... From the looks of it, okay, and submitting a question. So, Andrea, I think it's a pretty straightforward answer, no? Yeah, of course, man. USL, baby. Inter- <laughs> well, Inter Miami <laughs> fans are definitely rooting for Sacramento Republic. I don't think they're. I don't think any Inter Miami yeah. fan really wants Inter- wants Orlando City to win a trophy and to Listen, have success. Listen, that that is the like... real rivalry that Inter Miami has against Orlando. They're both um, teams in Florida, of course. Uh, uh, Miami fans should support uh, Sacramento the, instead of, of Orlando in the U.S. Open Cup. And then you need to support the underdog, man. That is the beauty of the cup uh, competition. Ho- 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 see, so we're supposed to be unbiased journalists. And I don't... Unbiased and I don't... And I don't, and I don't... Well, USL, baby. <laughs> okay, so I personally am unbiased. And I, you know, I don't have... Uh, uh, how do you say it? A dog in the fight a or a horse uh-huh. in the race. 
listen, can can people like the underdog story and is it nice and all that? I can absolutely understand that. I understand why you and Jose uh, like it. I just personally, just my own rules, I don't have a preference. Now, I, if I'm answering Lucho Lalo's question, absolutely no way Inter-Miami fans want Orlando City to win that and to have a cup and say, look, we have this and you don't. That's just it's the Florida rivalry. Especially because Orlando, if they win, they will play the CONCACAF Champions League, something that seems so far away for Inter-Miami. Something Inter-Miami very badly wants as an, or, or, as an organization yeah. as well. And don't forget, Orlando City knocked off Inter-Miami earlier in the tournament in, via, yeah. via penalty kicks. So absolutely no way any Inter-Miami fan wants Orlando City to win unless... Unless they're the type of inner Miami fan that's, you know, Florida first. That's the only way I can see it. If there's a fan out there that's like, I would rather no Florida way. team succeed. I hate people that do that. <laughs> well, those, I, I, listen, uh, Franco doesn't like to say, but I'm going to say it. Uh, uh, this is my profession, yes, but I have a team, obviously. And when my team plays in Honduras, and my team is in not international competition and someone comes to me and says, oh, you should support this other team that is representing the country. Hell to the no. <laughs> Andrea <laughs> said, no love for anybody except so, my team. Except nice. my team. So, nice, Lucho, nice. <laughs> uh, I agree with Frank and I have told you, uh, no, you need to support Sacramento Republic and I'm going to plug another one of my compatriots because Sacramento Republic has Dula Martinez. I was Martinez waiting for that. Putin. I was waiting for that. I, don't, Honduran. I, was, I was shocked out of my mind yes. that you did oh, not oh, mention him. It, oh, it took you and, this late into the pod to bring him up. My goodness. <laughs> I didn't want to make... I had done the Romel Kyoto one. <laughs> I didn't want to make it so... <laughs> so I to this weekend no but uh, i think yeah inter miami fans should definitely uh, the game is on september 7th so i don't know how many sacramento fans will be able to make that trip i guess a lot of them will but if you are an inter miami fan and you want to go it's uh obviously a labor day uh, week if you want to go to the parks and then go to watch nice soccer some nice football you should go it, it will be a great match and it, it, it's a great tournament the US, u.s open cup is one of my favorite tournaments in in concacaf i really like it because it gives the possibility of the lower leagues to to get to international competition and and to, and to win that i love that um, jose that, and andrea the their, their household loves the u.s open cup and they love the underdog story they just love it love it love it i will share that with the listeners again look listen I, to I have, me listen. i have been working here since the strikers so the strikers had a run they were eliminated in the semifinals then miami fc were eliminated in the quarterfinals so uh, the lower leagues get my love the nasl the usl so I'm going to support them, and I hope Inter-Miami fans are supporting also Sacramento Republic. They absolutely are. But look, I just again, to reiterate my personal rule, my personal, I'm just unbiased and impartial regardless of the game, unless Peru's playing. If Peru's playing, I'm not working. I'm not a journalist. I'm a Peru fan, 100%. And by the way, <laughs> speaking of that, today son fiestas patrias for Peru. Today's Peruvian Independence Day, Julio 28 oh, and 28. Thank you for reminding me by having this conversation. I, I might have I might have completely missed that otherwise on this podcast, which would have been an awful, awful thing. But anyway, again, I'm impartial and unbiased. Jose and Andrea absolutely love the underdog story. They absolutely have messaged me over the course of this season to express their delight when an underdog team pulls out the stops. Jose actually today, I will share this with the listeners in the press conference. He comes up to me, just you know, we said hi, we greeted, and then he comes over and he's like, "Man, did you watch the game last night?" And I could feel the twinkle. I could see the twinkle in his eye, and he was wearing a mask, a face mask, so I couldn't see him smile, but I felt like he was smiling because it was like it was like some some like pure bliss, like little kid joy there that like Sacramento Listen Republic is in that the thing? final, the first team, the first you the first. The first non-MLS team since 2008 to reach the final of an Open Cup. So it's, it's definitely a, a great achievement. It's a great story. I understand why people at, such as yourselves would like the, the, the narrative. Uh, but me personally, I, I don't get excited one way or the other. They're, they made it or Sporting Kansas City makes it. So anyway, let's move on because the next question, you're going to have to fill in here, Andrea. It comes from Atlante Herons. And he says, or she says, I don't know if it's he or she, my question is based on some of the comments made last week regarding Harvey Neville. Who is the better prospect between 
Him and Noah Allen, Cinco, sounded like he views Neville as a better prospect. So, Cinco is obviously one of Jose's nicknames, as well as Island Jose. He's not here, so maybe I'll ask him again next week, but to fill in for him, who better than his colleague and wife, Andrea Yanes, a.k.a. Ajisita. Andrea, I think you actually do agree with Jose on this one. So, I will ask you to answer for Jose Armando. Who's the better prospect, Harvey Neville or Noah Allen? In this moment, I agree with Jose. It's Harvey. Harvey has no, 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 European... No, 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 no. Better, 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 better. Sorry, I have, to, I have to cut you off there. Because you can't say right now. You have to. Better prospect means who has a brighter future. Not necessarily who's better right now. That's a different question. The, the word prospect is key there. The, the prospect means a player that will develop into something you know, important or that will develop. In, who will be the one that develops into the better player? That's the question. So now who's I better right it's, now? It's Neville. It's Harvey Neville because he has European background. He was born with the European school, which is one of the best in the world, if I dare not say the best place for players to grow, to develop. And he grew up there. He came here because his father obviously came came to 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 Inter Miami, so that's why he he is here. I think he's um, he's a better better prospect because of that. No Allen is a great talent. Is a great talent. When I saw him the first time, I remember asking Rafa, who is uh, Inter Miami communication. I asked him, "Who is that boy?" And no one was paying attention to him. And I asked Rafa, "Who is that boy?" And he told me, "No." He told me his name, and I told him, "Oh, he's gonna be very good. He has talent." But the problem is that No Allen is not a defender. No Allen is not a defender, and his growth can be um, stopped or he can be stunted. underdeveloped. Stunted. Stunted, yes. His growth, thank you, Franco. His growth can be stunted because of that. Because he has a knack for the attack. He has a foot that m not many players in the United States have. Like, he has real talent. He has an educated foot, as we say in Spanish. So he should be playing as a midfielder, a, a more attacking role. And I feel like him playing as a is not the best for him. So if that is his immediate future, he signed a deal with Inter Miami for many years. I think Harvey has the upper hand because, because of that. Because Harvey has some basic things that he learned in Europe and he developed in Europe with coaches that are more specialized uh, to every player's need and all of that. So they helped him be be good. But with Noah Allen, we see him getting responsibilities. And we saw him with the national team. He was not a starter. He was not one of the starts of the team. And he could be. He was a part-time starter. Seen... He was a part-time starter. Yeah, he, he was a part-time starter. He, he, could, he couldn't get his starting spot like Aronson, let, let me say. And he's as talented as Aronson. So um, that is why I, I choose Neville and I agree with Jose with that. Okay. So, because of his formation, basically. His development. Okay, I would yeah. say prospect. Prospect, I'm going with Noah Allen. I'm going with Noah Allen. Harvey Neville probably is more fundamentally sound today. Probably better tactically today. He's also two years older today. So he's further along in his development, probably in part due to the things you said, but also just due to the sheer fact that he's older but guess what? Harvey Neville still has not played first team football. Still has not played officially in his career first team soccer. Noah Allen has. Now you can call that circumstance. You could call that you know the roster and the left back situation. Okay, that's but fine. I, I understand can't that. Play because of his situation with his green card. I mean, listen, if he was that good. They could sign him and just get another green card, either via, I mean, excuse me, another in, uh, international roster slot, either via trade or, or you know, they could free Owen up by letting somebody else go. They could if he was that good. But the fact that they haven't shows that they're okay with waiting for him uh, over a longer term. But anyway, it's not about what Inter Miami's perspective is, it's or perception is. 
my opinion, based on some of the things you said, mm-hmm. and I do think Noah Allen has holes in his game as, as a teenager who's playing in the first full professional season with a first team. Defensively, he needs to be better. In his one-on-one, he needs to be better. Uh, tactically, in his ability to read the game, he needs to be better. But I see more from him with the ball and getting forward than I have when I've seen Harvey Neville play. And again, today, right now, Harvey Neville is the more polished of the two, in my opinion. But, talking about three, four, five years from now, and Noah Allen's getting experience internationally with the under-20 U.S. national team, no, whereas Harvey, see, that, Neville, that is, Harvey Neville is not, a, Harvey Neville's that is not getting that experience. More. What, what that is an espejismo because we have seen, I have seen a thousand players coming up from the U20 that don't make it. That's okay, Don't make that's it to fine. the... To that. I'm not, okay, I'm not saying Noah Allen is a 100% surefire bet. Guarantee that he's going to be a stud, he's going to have a lengthy career. I'm not saying that, but as a prospect, which is the key word, prospects pan yeah, out, they don't prospect. pan out. I think he's a better prospect today, longer term, than Harvey Neville. Just That's just my opinion. Uh, Another uh, advantage yeah. that Harvey has is obviously his last name. He's going to get a chance if he leaves Inter Miami. If, he's, if Phil leaves tomorrow and he leaves, he's going to have a chance in England or in whatever place in Europe he wants to play. Well, I mean, he, he's definitely going to have connections. But again, we're, we're just let's just talk about you know what they do on the field and what, what, you know, what we see. From the times I've seen Harvey Noah and the times I've seen Noah Allen. I think Noah Allen has has more of upside, has more of an upside. So we'll see how their their I, careers. I wish Noah Allen could get playing time in in his natural position. But see, that, no, he... see, no, no, no. See, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick, you know, I was gonna end the Q and A session there, but I have to pick a bone with that because actually we've talked about this uh, quite often. He's you not and a I. defender. He's a left back. To me, he's a left back. I, no, you he's think, not you a left think back. He's a left so mid- he is I know you think back. he's a left midfielder. I know you think that's where he. You know, that's where if Andrea was a scout, Andrea would project Noah Allen to be a left midfielder. In a, in a few years time me personally I think left back yes again he has work to do there in terms of tactics in terms of understanding the game in terms of positionally in terms of winning his one-on-one duels 100% all of that but I still think he is a good as a prospect a good uh, attacking fullback prospect that's how I would put it I know you disagree. I know you think he's more of a midfielder, or yeah, he his profile leans to be more of a midfielder. We'll see. We'll see how how the careers unfold for both of them. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. They are both talented. Listen, and they're both they young. Both and they're both young. 20 they are and both young. They both have contracts with Inter. Well, Harvey will sign <laughs> Harvey a contract when yet. he gets yeah. gets his green card, hopefully soon. Uh, and he will, he will, he will, he will be a, a first team player. So with this, listen, Inter Miami has a lot of potential uh, for the future. With Noah Allen and uh, and uh, Harvey and other players that are in the second team that that we will see in the future with 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 the first team. So e- either way, whatever the opinion for the question, Jose is going to answer in the future. He's gonna give his opinion also, but. Hopefully, we, we gave you something to think about because <laughs> it's a nice topic, interesting topic. And it's, good, it's, a good, it's, it's, nice. a, it's a good debate. It's a good talking point to have. A nice, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a fun good, one to chew on because point. there's no right or wrong answer. We have to see. We have to wait exactly. and give it time to see what the, future, what the future has in store. Okay, that does it for the Q&A session. Andrea, final thought. I will go first because I think mine could be both of ours. Because it's something I've been wanting to talk about with you on this podcast for a while. And I think this is going to take us a few minutes. So it might be a joint final thought. And I look forward to your rebuttal. Andrea and I, Ajisita, as spicy as she is, has debated furiously with me over recent weeks. And I've been trying to get her on the pod to talk about it. But other pods have gone long. Now it's just her and I. We're going to talk about it. I think Christopher McVeigh has been one of Inter Miami's best players this season because he's been one of the most consistent. Andrea disagrees with that wholeheartedly. Maybe she's had a change of opinion in the last week or two since we've discussed this. But she has argued, debated very arduously that Christopher McVeigh is not in the top five for Inter Miami in terms of performers this season. I think he is. I don't think he wows you, but I think he does his job. He does his his function and his responsibilities. He does them 
solidly, and he has for much of the year. And I think there's a reason why he's been uh, one of the leaders on this team, if not the leader in terms of minutes played, along with DeAndre Yedlin. So for me, McVay, absolutely one of the top performers. Phil Neville actually raved about him a couple of weeks ago in a press conference. That's where this this whole conversation kind of started, although it goes back even before then because Andrea thinks Christopher McVay is uh, Highway McVay, McVay Avenue. Like anybody down his left flank, you know, is able to, to just run up and down that, that corridor. So I will leave it there. Andrea, you're, the floor is yours for a rebuttal if you want. Yes, Franco, I don't agree. McVay has been one of the top five players on the team this year. I have said a thousand times on this podcast that I will not criticize him because I understand he's playing out of position, but I cannot lie. He loses the majority of the duels one-on-one. That is the truth. And um, for me, other players have been better than him, and I'm going to give you my list to see Go for if it. Go our for it. I was going to say, give me the five. Give me the five that you think are better than McVay this year based on performance. We're not talking about... about uh, we're not talking about if they Quality. wow you. We're talking, yeah. yeah. We're talking about what they have produced yeah. for Inter Miami on the field in 2022. Okay, let's do Go. it. My first player is Leonardo Campana. Okay. My second player is the Andre Yedlin. Okay. My third player is Damian Lowe. Okay. My fourth player is Gregore, okay. and my fifth player is Calend. Okay. So I would say, out of those, out of those. The only one that I would say is up there for a fight, and even then, because of his form as of late, no, is Leonardo Campana. Besides that, besides that, and you know what? I'll throw in DeAndre Yedlin. I could hear an argument for Yedlin and for Campana. I could hear the argument, but I think McVeigh has been the most consistent player for Inter Miami, and he's not been flawless, as nobody on this team has been, but he has not been at fault for for many goals from my analysis of matches, from my analysis of the, the tallies that have been conceded. And, you know, you, you, the, you could look back. I know we argued about this and debated about this uh, very strongly after the, the Charlotte FC game where Inter Miami won 3-2. to two. DeAndre Yedlin, look, he, he gets forward much better. He projects forward and, and he gets involved in the attack and he combines a, a, a lot better. Because Yedlin McVay, gives more of that right. to a team than McVeigh. Fine, they correct, know, correct. I agree with that. But... Not Inter Miami always lose. Damon Lowe is the leader of the defense and should play no, every no, no, game. No, no. Hold on, if McVeigh doesn't they, play, no, the no, team no. can win. No, see, I disagree that with that. That is a simple No, as I disagree that. with that because Damian Lowe has had. Damian Lowe has had he has made mistakes. Yes, yes uh, more but he mistakes. Is the most more important mistakes. player in the defense for this team. Look at how they play without him. If Look if he's in form, if he's in form, and as of late, I don't think he's been in form. I think again, I've repeat, I've said this before. I think he's taken a uh, hit to his confidence. But but Damian Lowe, in my analysis, in my opinion, has been to has been at fault for more goals than Christopher McVeigh uh, has had rougher moments, right? Like the own goal against, the, me, wait, hold on, the own goal against that, Orlando, then he's had McVay, penalty kicks called against him. He's had he's had two he's gotten ejected he's, twice in games if I'm not mistaken. He's and, a and, serviceable player to the team. As a lot, yes. He is not the best. I didn't not he's even been the, the most defender. consistent. Yedlin the most and consistent. Damian Lowe are more important than him. I would not no mm-hmm. see no. I don't yes. like McVeigh doesn't get forward well at all, he's but he's not a left back, so you like you understand that he's playing. He's been played mostly out of position, and he's. I think again, he's done a serviceable job. But even then, right? Like I agree that, Ye- that I agree that Yedlin gets forward. I agree that Yedlin is more of a threat. I g- agree that Yedlin gives the team more football, more soccer because of that ability. But even still, he doesn't produce a whole lot in the final third, even with all of that. And you can look at it just from a statistical standpoint. Yedlin to this point, unless the numbers have changed, but I don't think so. Since I last looked, Yedlin has two assists. McVeigh has one. And McVeigh doesn't get forward yeah, but that much. it's not only about the it's numbers, not, Franco. It's, it's what they bring. Ye- uh, Yedlin right, but Yedlin is weaker. Yedlin's weaker defensively. More Yedlin's weaker than defensively. what McVeigh, or, or my, McVeigh does. Yedlin is and weaker he's a defensively. Good player. He should be starting. He 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 should be starting with Damian Lowe in the defense, and the defense will be different for Inter Miami. Instead of rotating all these players and all of that, they both should be starting. 
McVay and Damian Lowe as central defenders. Well, maybe, they, maybe they will now that Gibbs moment, is healthy again. Maybe they will now that you, Gibbs is healthy. Uh, in this moment, you ask me who has been better, and I look at it not only the numbers, but overall for the team. Look at the state of the defense against New York City FC, the mess that we've talked about it before. It's because Damian Lowe is missing. And you saw it against Barcelona. Who who played the whole game? Of course, you saw that the pie goal, but that happens to every defender. It even happened to Boateng, who was the better defender against Messi and Barcelona. In, in, it, that happens to everyone. It's Barcelona. So you can, he was the only one that played the, the whole game because that is who Phil trusts more than McVay. McVay is a good no, player, no, no, a good no, person. No, no way, Andrea, no way, no way. He service to his no team, way. sacrificing no. his no. career. Because, listen, no, Franco, way, no, 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 you're, will no. Come, no team will come now and try to sign Christopher McVay for him to play as a left back. Of course not, that but they would sign back. him to play as a center back. But and it's, he's it's, sacrificing it's... himself for the team. Hey, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not he disagreeing with that. He deserves recognition for that. But and even still, playing out of position. Yedlin, yes, he's been he's better, not than better than Yedlin. He's Absolutely. not better than Yedlin. Absolutely. 100% than Yedlin. Yedlin. He is not better than Campana. Yedlin has he's been involved in multiple goals given up. Yedlin has been involved in multiple goals given up. And, you know, someone tried to point the I don't know. I don't remember if it was you or somebody else in the press box during the the recent weather delay at Drive Stadium, but they were like, "Well, Yedlin's an all star." Yeah, Yedlin's an all star because he's a U.S. Men's National Team player in a in an all star game that's all about marketing. And guess what? In a World Cup year, they're going to call in a U.S. Men's National Team player. Is he there based off of merit? I don't think so. My opinion, I don't think so. And he, in my opinion, in my analysis, he's been at fault for more breakdowns or more goals given up than Christopher McVay has. Again, I'm not saying Christopher McVay has been flawless, yes, but I do think he's I been more consistent than DeAndre Look I at the Charlotte the goal, the Jordi Reina golazo that he scored at the end of the first half in that 3-2 victory for Inter-Miami. That one's on DeAndre Yedlin. DeAndre Yedlin gives him time and space Franco, to pick out that, that top corner. Wh- that is what happens when you play. I'm, I'm telling you, it, football is about scoring. They're going to score. You're going to make mistakes. But what every player brings to the team, you cannot discuss here and tell me that McVay brings more than Yedlin, more than Campana, more than I didn't say brings more. more. I said he's no. been more not, consistent. He's not even a leader. He's not even a leader. So I cannot count him as the best he's player in the consistent. team. And not in the top five. Yes, he's he's been serviceable for the team playing out of position. Yes, he's been but more he consistent. He's right not in the top five. Even Ariel Lasito has been better. That's than a him. wild take. That's 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 yeah. blasphemy. Franco, to me. you are. That's wild. You, that's wild. You, he's not the best team, Franco. How can you say right. he's the best player of the team? I said he's the most consistent player on this team. The player that yes, from you game said to the game. Top five. From, you from, asked yeah, me for from, my top and five. You, you didn't even put him in there. That's wild. You didn't even put him in there. That's that's blasphemy to me. Like I don't even know what games you're watching. Like because he ha- okay. He, you think he, he has been better than Calendar the whole season? From game to game, he has been more consistent. His level is not has never gone too high or too low. He's never been wow, but he's never been like darn. Except for maybe the Austin game. That's the one exception where they lost five to one and everybody looked bad in that game. That's the one mm-hmm. game where I was like, all right, he had a terrible game. But besides that, I've never come away saying. Man, McVeigh really messed it up there. It really was bad. And even there. in the Barcelona game, or you are. Barcelona game doesn't count. The Barcelona game doesn't count. It. No, the game before Barcelona, you were trying to blame Mota for the goal, and I told you, man, that McVeigh. It was fault, Mota. You didn't... Mota was the one that. No, no. Yeah. That is, Mota gets that the ball the taken off his foot. One no. on no. one, no. he didn't have to pass the ball to Mota when he had a player on top. It was a throw in. That is no, soccer, no, no, football no, one no, on no. one. No, Gene Mota had t- more you time. Think, Gene Mota think, takes two touches think, on the ball, or try. He takes a touch on the ball, no, and then he gets stripped. You never do that. Ask any coach. Ask any coach no. if that throwing was no. was a good throw no. even phil neville Ask i think i think phil neville even afterwards pointed the fact that gene mota uh you know he, no, he got he along the ball Franco, too much I, I could be wrong i could be wrong but a throwing you don't do a throw we will, like that we will leave it there we'll let, leave that as our final thought for you listeners I want one to more no no final thought no 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 i don't want to be censored please help me I just want to say to end the, the podcast in this note, uh, everyone leave their comment. And I want to say everyone go and listen what Phil Neville said about relegation, promotion and relegation with within the United States. He made some good comments. So go check it out on the YouTube, Miami Total YouTube. 
there his his remarks are there so go check them out he's a fan of promotion relegation as i think a lot of people are but obviously the people that make decisions in u.s soccer or in mls they uh they for whatever reason <clears throat> money um they don't uh they don't implement it here in the united states and canada but anyway we will leave it there for this week's pod we'll be back again next week with two episodes given that there's two games on the schedule so for andrea yanis aka Akisita, i am frank Penizo. you have been listening to miami total football radio <laughs>